overview of Nietzsche's life and works, uh, and then we'll start talking about the process of the genealogy. Um, skipping over genealogy, um, 1887, and then now we come to the last year of his productive life in 1888, uh, when he wrote five books. Um, the first was The Case of Wagner, which was a sort of um, sarcastic polemic against his former inspiration. Um, and this was followed by um, a book called The Twilight of the Idols, which the title was a pun on Wagner's opera, Twilight of the Gods. Um, and here in these last few works, um, he's very, very clear that the attacks on truth that he's been um, discussing are attacks on the idea of truth with a capital T concerning the true world that somehow apart from or behind the world of appearances, metaphysical truths apart from and superior to um, ordinary empirical truths. Um, now, Nietzsche had been working on a book that was to be called um, The Will to Power. I'll say something about that book uh, in a minute. But in 1888, he abandoned this project, put aside papers that he had written and notebooks uh, for the book that he planned to call The Will to Power. Um, I'm remembering correctly, I didn't check this, but I'm remembering correctly, I believe he asked have those destroyed, or they weren't. Um, and he began a new project that he was going to call uh, the revaluation of all values. Um, and as part of that project, uh, he completed a first section, the first part, um, which he called um, the Antichrist. Uh, sometimes, uh, uh, Sometimes a, a more arguably more accurate uh, translation of the title would be anti-Christian, as opposed to anti-Christ. Um, and this is really the most um, hyperbolic attacks on Christianity in his work. Um, but he has a surprise in this work. He has a surprisingly respectful attitude toward Jesus himself. The real villain of this piece is Paul, the founder of the Christian church. So it's the church that is um, most under attack. Um, on his 44th birthday in October of that year, he began, began work on a kind of autobiographical commentary on his previous publications um, called Ecce Homo. Um, and um, I've mentioned a few of the passages here. This, this is, uh, I quoted from this, talking about the um, birth of tragedy. Um, um, on, at the end of that year, uh, in December of 1888, he completed Nietzsche contra Wagner, um, which was basically an edited and, and revised collection of his previous writings on Wagner. Um, and that was his last work. Um, in early January of 1889, um, Nietzsche saw a um, horse being whipped viciously, and he ran to the horse, threw his arms around it, and collapsed. Um, a few days later, he recovered long enough, covered his senses long enough to write a few letters, um, and then he sort of lapsed back into his insanity um, and never really was uh, able to recover. Um, he was first institutionalized and then put under the care of his mother. Um, under her care, he was able to uh, talk and occasionally received some visitors, um, and spent a lot of time uh, improvising 
Um, in 1893, um, his brother-in-law, I, I mentioned to you, his sister Elizabeth, um, in 1893, his brother-in-law committed suicide in Paraguay, where he and Elizabeth had gone to, to try to establish a pure Aryan colony. I mentioned that he was a notorious anti-Semite. Um, when her husband committed suicide, uh, she then returned to Germany and gradually took control of Nietzsche and his work and his archive from um, their mother. And she promoted him as a kind of, um, uh, I don't know, like cult-like leader. Um, and she created the Nietzsche archives in uh, 1894. 1897, um, their mother died, and um, was still, Nietzsche was still alive, and he and his papers and his works were left under the sole charge of his sister Elizabeth. And his fame at this point was beginning to spread, mostly under her promotion, and she really exploited this mercilessly. She dressed him up in robes and exhibited him for tourists, and kind of like a circus freak. Um, and finally, in, in 1900, Nietzsche died. Um, unfortunately, the story doesn't stop there. It's bad enough. Um, but the next year, um, she uh, selected and published various fragments um, from his notebooks under, sorry, notebooks between 1885 and 1889. So over a series of several years near the end of his life, Life. She pulled these fragments and notebooks together under the title of The Will to Power. And she promoted this collection of unpublished notes, previously unpublished notes, as his unfinished masterpiece. So I mentioned a moment ago that he had been working on a book to be called The Will to Power. It wasn't this book. Um, he had abandoned it, um, but she put it together under that title. Um, in 1910 to 11, uh, she supervised um, the publication of highly edited collection of his works and a revised and expanded edition of The Will to Power. Um, still under her influence, his fame spread. Um, and I think I mentioned in a class or two ago that in the 1930s, she convinced um, Hitler to try to take seriously um, Nietzsche as a um, sort of semi-official philosopher. Um, and Hitler visited her and um, the Nietzsche archives um, in the early 30s. Um, his sister died in 1935. Um, Hitler attended her funeral. Um, it was only a few years later, I mentioned before, um, that uh, Kaufman's book on Nietzsche was in 1950, um, began to take seriously um, Nietzsche's work as a, as a philosopher. During World War II, um, uh, Hitler had uh, distributed copies of Zarathustra um, to Nazi troops. I mentioned Kaufman and Nietzsche in 1950. Um, it wasn't until 1967 um, that publication of a scholarly edition of his complete works um, was begun. It only uh, was completed in the 1980s, so very, very recent. Um, and up through the 1970s, there was still controversy about the authenticity of some of his letters and uh, a diary, which turned out to be a forgery. OK, so this brings me to one last preliminary point. Um, and that is uh, maybe the status of the material published in the book called The Will to Power. Um, and you might not think that much hangs on the sort of philological pedigree of um, these 
uh, materials, but in this case a lot does. Uh, because it's only in the collection called the Will to Power, these unpublished notes, it's only there that he is apparently trying to give what looks like um, what, what appear to be sort of um, serious philosophical arguments for the truth of the idea of the eternal recurrence. So I emphasize to you um, that um, in the published works, when he talks about the idea of the eternal recurrence, he presents it as a kind of thought experiment. He says, what if a demon were to come to you and say, blah, 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 what would your reaction be? And so the way I uh, suggested it's presented there is that this is a kind of test to see whether your affirmation of your values point to this world, in which case you would be Joy, he thinks, to uh, find that uh, that this world is going to uh, eternally recur, or you are living this life in order to achieve something in some other world, and if the eternal recurrence were true, that wouldn't exist. So it's a kind of test for you. It's not entirely unlike testing your maxims according to a categorical imperative. It's a different test, but it's a kind of test. Okay, um, in the will to power, in these unpublished notes, is the only place that we get something that looks like an argument for eternal recurrence as a cosmological truth, like the way the world actually is. So some people on that basis think that Nietzsche is committed to a certain metaphysics of eternal recurrence. Um, Heidegger, for example, um, says um, famously, quoted for you, what Nietzsche himself published during his creative life was always foreground. His philosophy proper was left behind as posthumous, unpublished. So some people, like Heidegger, for example, in interpreting Nietzsche, take these fragments to be the true Nietzsche and his published works um, to be um, preliminary to that. Um, I want to talk about one more case here. Um, and that is not the book, but the idea of the world to power. Um, in many of these fragments, in the book, in the collection of the world to power, in many of these fragments, um, Nietzsche seems to be again offering a kind of metaphysical view about the, uh, about the idea of the will to power. So that everything, so a metaphysical point, everything ultimately in its deep and true nature is simply an expression of power. That, uh, that one thing that philosophy can do on this interpretation is look behind the Empirical, look behind the ordinary world of science to disclose what's hidden behind there, namely, simply a struggle for power. That that's how to understand what really is going on. Um, there's another, uh, sorry, and those kinds of passages that seem to suggest that metaphysical view just like the kind of passages that suggest eternal recurrence as a cosmological doctrine, those are almost exclusively found in these new books. Um, 